so much to discuss. Let's meet our panel. Uh, Matt McCowiak uh, is a political commentator, and he joins us from Austin, Texas. From New York, we've got Kevin Powell. He's a writer, activist, and public speaker. Here in the studio is Simon Marks, president and chief correspondent of Feature Story News, also my old boss. And from Beijing, we have Robert Moran. He's a political consultant. Welcome all. You know, Robert, we've got you in Beijing. So uh, you're looking from outside the country into the US right now. So I thought we'd start off with you. Um, how is the US political system and the divide here in the US looking from Beijing one year on? Well, I work uh, in Washington, uh, and I'm here on business uh, in Beijing through the day and flying back to Washington, uh, back to the United States uh, tonight. Um, the coverage here is very interesting. It's dominated by uh, the discussion around APEC, the APEC summit, and TPP and trade. Uh, and that's what's all over the papers here. I think back home, um, the discussion is still about Donald Trump, because one of the things about living in the Trump era is we're always talking about uh, Donald <laughs> Trump. Yeah, it's quite incredible how Trump alone has dominated the headlines in the last year. Um, let's go to Matt in Texas. Um, what, let's just go back to, that year, uh, to a year ago, because, you know, journalists like me and many others um, who even follow him were, were surprised that he won, frankly. Um, has he brought that Trumpism into his first year? What's the result? Yeah, I, th I think there's not much doubt that he has uh, worked to deliver on the things that he promised as a candidate. Um, I think as it relates to executive, uh, executive um, uh, activities, executive branch, cabinet, executive orders, uh, things, things like that, I think he's been mostly successful to this point. Um, whether it was uh, Congress using the Congressional Review Act to pull back regulations, whether Matt, it was pulling out of TPP. Pardon? Yeah, Matt, Matt, I just wanted to butt in. But, you know, let's just go through a couple of the things that happened. We've had, for example, uh, an immigration ban that was struck down by the courts. We've had uh, controversies over white supremacy, uh, a pulling down of statues. <coughs> it, uh, you know, there's been a real uh, feeling that this country has really divided. We even have, you know, NFL football players taking the knee against police brutality. This is not bringing the country together, is it? <clears throat> okay, but that wasn't your question to me. Your question was, has he brought Trumpism? And my, and my answer was going through the things that he's done. Sure. Sure. I, I, I do believe that, that, that the country's been divided. I think there's no question about that. I think you, you, you played the soundbite from his election night speech. That mm. was a unifying speech, and I don't think he has been the unifying figure that he that he could have been. Now that said, we have seen stronger Democratic opposition to him as president than mm. any time uh, in, in my memory. They delayed the cabinet longer than any time ever. Uh, they're slowing down every single thing they possibly can. They won't even work with him on areas where they do have some <laughs> agreement on issues like trade. So uh, look, the country's very divided. There's no question about that. We had a very divisive national election. Obviously, the Russia inquiry uh, is is a cloud that hangs over all of this, and we have to see how that gets resolved. So there are huge questions, and I would just wrap up by saying he's been fundamentally unsuccessful legislatively 10 months into his new administration. Mm. Now, it appears they're going to make a very good run at passing tax reform. The House will pass it this week. The Senate committee will move it out this week. Hopefully the Senate will pass it next couple weeks. There's still a good chance they're going to get something big done before the end of the year. But legislatively, he's been unsuccessful. Through the executive branch, I think he's been mostly successful. But the country's certainly divided, and his numbers are historically weak right now. Uh, Kevin Powell in New York. Um, OK, we've seen some division, but I remember my, coming to the United States uh, 20 years ago when uh, a certain president uh, was impeached, uh, uh, largely following an affair with a White House intern. Uh, then there was uh, George W. Bush and the Iraq War, divisive times under Obama. Is this era different, or is it just for the outside of the international uh, viewer? Is it just U.S. politics as usual, or is it reaching, reaching a new level? Well, I think it's a combination of it. It's definitely U.S. politics as usual. We've always been divided. As long as I've been involved in politics, mm. which goes back to the era of Jimmy Carter and, and, and Ronald Reagan and paying attention you know, to now, that's always been the case. But I think that what Donald Trump has represented in his uh, nearly one year in office is a kind of ugliness that we've never seen before, in my humble opinion, in American history with the leadership of the country, where it's openly uh, promoting divi uh, division and, 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 and 
uh, helping to instigate things like Charlottesville, helping to instigate things that we see around the country where people are pitted against each other. And certainly it doesn't help that that there really is a, a vacuum in his leadership. I mean, he's not, let's be real about it, he's not even qualified to be president of the United States. He simply got to the position because of his great wealth and and the fact that he has been able to market himself in a certain kind of way. He's really a product of, of where we are in American society at this time where it was a it was more of a popularity contest than anything else. And even though there he didn't win the popular vote, but enough people voted for him that he got into the presidency. So I think this sets a really bad precedent, in my humble opinion, for where we go as a country. And as someone who also travels outside the country extensively, next week I'll be mm. in Europe. These are conversations that we're having with people in other parts of the world, like what has happened to America? What has happened to your, your, your leadership position? Kevin, thanks for that. I'm going to bring in Simon Marks here, who uh, reports for a lot of different international news organizations. Kevin brought up two points I'd like you to respond to. First of all, you know, the rest of the world is uh, really looking at this presidency like in a microscopic way that others haven't. But also, at the beginning, because Hillary Clinton won more of the popular vote, mm -hmm. but he won the Electoral College, there was this little legitimacy question too, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, but we've seen that, legitim that legitimacy question debated here in the United States before. At the end of the day, Hillary Clinton lost the election won, by the yeah. rules of the election, and he won it. He can claim to be the, legitimate, the legitimately elected president of the United States. Just look at a couple of things that have happened in the last 24 hours. First of all, take a look at what the British Prime Minister Theresa May had to say yesterday about Russian interference in British affairs. She articulated words and views that the President of the United States, Donald Trump, has never articulated about Russian interference in American affairs. That's an astonishing position for Donald Trump and Theresa May, who on paper ought to be, you know, philosophical and ideological soulmates. They're both from conservative political parties. That's an astonishing position yeah, to, to exist. But secondly, he's in the air right now. He's flying home from this 11-day trip to Asia. What happened on Capitol Hill today? The Senate Foreign Relations Committee, on which the Republicans enjoy a majority, presided over by a Republican, Senator Bob Corker, started debating whether to strip him of his authority to launch a nuclear strike. His issue is not just that he's divided the country and fermented division within the country, he's fermented division within the Republican Party, and that's a massive problem for him. I'm glad you mentioned that so early in the show, because for, for, for some of our international uh, viewers, they not, may not be aware of this sort of two wars going on a little bit politically now. Matt, would you like to address that from Texas, that we've seen a lot of uh, division but also internal division in terms of the Republican Party. And please try and explain it to our international audience, because it's very complicated and uh, uh, pretty intense right now, right? It is. I think that's a very legitimate uh, area to go into. Um, let me specifically speak to the hearing that Simon raised. Um, I, I do think the headlines from that hearing or the existence of that hearing uh, related to the president's authority to launch nuclear strike uh, is, in a word, striking. Uh, the substance of the hearing, though, basically found that there are enough checks uh, in the system and it's a multi-layered process okay. that there was no, no action taken. Now, that said, yes, there is something of a civil war going on in the Republican Party. There's a lot of, I think, concern, at least among Republican senators, about the way that President Trump carries out his duties. The challenge for them is that, that, that Trump remains very popular among Republican voters. In public polling, we've seen him the in, in the, yeah. you know, basically high 70s to mid 80s among support among Republicans. And so for a Republican senator to criticize Trump, that may be what they believe, but that's not necessarily what their voters believe. Look, Trump is not a uh, sort of reliable, predictable Republican. He's very non-ideological in a lot of ways. He has sort of his own views, his own nationalist, populist views. Uh, and his platform was not necessarily the platform that other Republicans ran on. And so when he says and does things that are not sort of in the mainstream of where the Republican Party is, you are going to see some Republicans step up uh, and make clear that that's not what the party uh, believes. But that is a difficult place to be in, given that you have 80 percent support among Republican voters. Uh, that was uh, so well explained. I really, I really appreciate that. Um, Kevin, um, these two wings of the party, of the Republican Party that is obviously the, pa the party in power in the White House and uh, of the U.S. Congress are split. And some have accused one wing of the party of being pretty nationalist. Uh, they proved that you can win a, an election without the diversity that the Republican Party thought they needed after defeats in uh, 2008. Um, yeah. How is that, in your view, reflected in the first year of Trump's presidency? 
Oh my gosh. I mean, in one way, I was listening to the gentleman who just spoke from Austin very eloquently. I mm. feel that in a lot of ways, Donald Trump is actually trying to destroy and remake the party in his own image. You know, and I love what he said about it being, you know, not really beholden to any ideology. But at the same time, we're very clear, those of us who have been watching this thing, that there's a certain kind of, of, of white supremacist energy, let's just call it what it is, that propelled him into office, appealing to the, the basic uh, uh, energies of, of working class white brothers and sisters in this country really pandering to racism, you know, without saying it. And as a result, you know, he's really written in this way, which is why you see people in Alabama saying, we don't care that senatorial candidate, the Republican Rory Moore, may be accused of, you know, having uh, inappropriate relations with girls, you know, when he was in his 30s years back. We care about the fact that he represents our ideological viewpoint, which is the same thing that, rep that Donald Trump is about. And so it's unfortunate to me that, you know, we have a presidency that on the one hand is causing much infighting in the country among all of us, but also within his own party, but at the same time, really appealing to the, the worst tenets of American society. You know, we, we've tried to move away from racism. We tried to move away from a narrow kind of nationalism that's about us against them. Okay. And this party is actually propelling that through Donald Trump. Uh, uh, Robert, I want to bring you in from Beijing. I mean, obviously, strong opinions there. From the international perspective, do, uh, you travel a lot, not just in, in Beijing. Do you feel that that's the sort of view of America, that it, there's a racial divide going on? And also, We've seen an uptick in sort of gun violence as well uh, in terms of uh, mass murder. Um, is this resonating globally? Well, I think it's important to uh, make a distinction between sort of average folks on the street and uh, world leaders and uh, elites in the different societies that the United States interacts with. Uh, there's, I think, uh, among the former, there might be sort of caricatures and sort of general biases in how they understand the United States, but among the latter, there's very sophisticated understanding. So elites around the world and world leaders and policymakers understand U.S. politics and understand U.S. society, and this is the way they look at it. They understand that Donald Trump's uh, job approval ratings are low, 38% uh, give or take uh, in the recent tracking. Mm -hmm. Um, they understand that uh, the generic congressional ballot, which is how you measure uh, the upcoming uh, midterm elections and what could happen, uh, a generic Republican versus a generic Democrat, they understand that Democrats are leading in the generic ballot by about plus 10, which would challenge the congressional Republican majority. Uh, but they also look at the polling data and see a rising stock market, rising consumer confidence, uh, and very actually strong data in the polling suggesting that people are feeling more optimistic about the prevalence of jobs, about the economic situation. So we're at an interesting moment mm. in time. People may not tr trust the president. They may give him low job approval scores, but they may be seeing the economy on the rise, uh, in which case at some point, for the midterm elections, people will have to decide whether they reward or punish uh, the Republicans. And if the economy continues to improve, it may be very interesting. People think that Donald Trump will be difficult to reelect. Um, I was a never Trumper as a Republican. But the fact is, is that the economy continues to improve and Americans see that. They'll respect that. And he may have a path to victory and he may have a path to reelection as hard as it is as, as hard as it may believe, be to believe today. Uh, I think can I respond to that? Yeah, elite, Matt, I was going to ask you to respond to that. that. Yeah. Uh, Matt, also, uh, you know, is it going to be a case of the midterm elections in November 2018 where are you better off than you were two years ago? Uh, and, and that could really help him and keep the, make the Republican Party stay in control because the economy is very good. But yeah, I, something I, he said... I think that's... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So go ahead, Matt. Uh, yeah, I think in that's... Texas. I think that, yeah, I think that's right. I, th I think there's three hurdles uh, that we have to see how they get resolved uh, before the midterms. I think, number one, uh, do they pass tax reform? I think that's already been basically priced into the stock market. And so if that were to fail, I think there would be at least a short-term economic hit. Number mm. two is, does the, does the Russia inquiry get resolved? Or are there more shoes to drop? Is Don, Donald Trump Jr. indicted? Uh, is Jared Kushner indicted? Does it somehow get closer to the president directly, which I think is unlikely to happen, but certainly could happen? Uh, and then third, do we see the economy continue to improve? I mean, that is a huge question. 
I agree the stock market is, is, has been in good shape, the S&P 500, et cetera, but we haven't seen wages consistent, uh, considerably rise yet, mm. and that is going to matter. But the midterms, remember, are a year away. We're halfway there. <laughs> uh, and so I, don't, I agree that the Virginia results were very disappointing and very concerning and should be concerning for Republicans, but we're still a year away. There's a huge questions. Do they right. do something to, to solve the issue of DACA, which relates to, to, to people that came here as children illegally? Uh, what happens with the spending bill fight at the end of the year? What happens on tax reform? Do right. they take another run at health care? These are huge policy questions that are going to be resolved in the next three to six months, and they're going to affect the midterms. Uh, I want to get on to the midterms and, yeah. uh, and Virginia in a minute. I just want to bring Simon Marks in here because we haven't actually talked about the elephant or the bear in the room properly yet, which is, is the Russia investigation. Yeah. Uh, now, this has sort of dogged Donald Trump even before he was sworn in as president and seems to be gathering steam. Where are we and what effect could it have? Well, I think they're in very, very grave difficulty about this. I mean, Matt was saying, you know, is it, is it are there going to be more shoes to drop? There are shoes dropping every single day. Uh, if you read the plea agreement that was struck by his former foreign policy advisor, George Papadopoulos, with uh, Robert Mueller, the uh, special prosecutor who, of course, is leading this investigation, you know, you can't really read that plea agreement and conclude, as Donald Trump keeps maintaining there was no collusion. It's absolutely apparent that there were multiple attempts at collusion and every single time, whether it was George Papadopoulos or Donald Trump Jr. now in these latest exchanges with WikiLeaks, every single time a conversation is begun, the Trump people are all saying, that's very interesting. Tell me more about that. I'd like to hear more about that. They're not saying what they should have been saying, which is, it's inappropriate for me to have this conversation. Now we need to call the FBI. So, uh, you know, does this ultimately lead to the very top? I think that is still an open question. Does it matter but outside trail, of Washington? Uh, well, no, I think it does matter outside of Washington. And I think it matters for a bigger reason, Nathan, which is that, you know, w w wonderful that the stock market's performing well and so on and so forth. But America is losing its way on the international stage mm -hmm. as that shining city on the hill that Rob Ronald Reagan used to talk about. And we've just witnessed Donald Trump on the sidelines at the APEC summit while everybody else is agreeing to move forward with TPP. Uh, you know, Donald Trump having productive meetings with Xi Jinping of China, but did he bring any meaningful concessions back from there? The international community understands this is a fundamentally weak leader who is slowly disengaging America from the traditional role that it's played uh, as the promoter of democracy and human rights on the world stage, and that's a huge seismic shift. Does it also mean that sort of um, Trump doesn't really know what's going on? I mean, you know, it, 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 the Russia investigation uh, may actually not blame the president, but he could lose credibility, do you well, think? He, there's two realities. I mean, there are facts and there are alternative facts, and Donald Trump lives increasingly in a world of, in, uh, of alternative facts. The claim that there was no collusion simply is no longer substantiated by the facts. Incredible. Do you think there could be impeachment proceedings? No, because I think that uh, the Republicans are very, very unlikely uh, to uh, move down that path. I think it's more likely that if you get to a position where a sufficient number of Republicans are sufficiently disquiet, uh, and concerned, they'll start looking at the 25th Amendment of the country's constitution, Section 4, which allows essentially for a constitutional coup against the president. But we are way, 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 a long way away from that happening. Well, it sounds like a, no, a house I of think, cards. I think you need to look at the midterms. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, and let's talk about the midterms, because we had I, a sort I, of signal, we had I, a signal towards there um, just in the last few days or so, where we had a, a governor's election uh, in... Virginia, but also a lot of other uh, races as well. And let's just listen to the new governor-elect of Virginia, who's a Democrat, and won by a wide margin. Virginia has told us to end the divisiveness, that we will not condone hatred and bigotry, and to end the politics that have torn this country apart. <clears throat> Matt, can you respond to that? Um, that was Ralph Northam, the uh, governor-elect of Virginia, obviously not mentioning Trump by name, but, but perhaps addressing what he thinks of what's happened to the U.S. under the first year of the Trump administration. Yeah, I think from his perspective, that's, that's a pretty effective message. Of course, that was after he won. That was the night he won. That was the message he wanted to convey. I would say that, that there's two things, I think, to be said about Virginia as it relates to the midterms. I think, number one, 
uh, you had a state, a commonwealth, I guess technically, that uh, that Hillary Clinton had won by a decent margin, but mm. but the Democrat then expanded that margin uh, for the governor's race and and won by a much larger margin. I think the final margin was nine percent right. than anyone predicted. So so that shows that they were able to grow the vote uh, in a battleground state. Now I think second is that Virginia is not necessarily reflective of the rest of the country, and it's not reflective of where the key races in the House and Senate are going to be. Okay. Uh, that race was defined by the, the suburbs, suburban voters, many of whom are in, in and around Washington, D.C., which is a very federal government uh, dependent, you know, sort of bureaucratic area uh, that, that, that really wanted to send a message to Trump and wanted to send a nat national message. And that, 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 that victory was really decided in the suburbs. OK, I, I want to go to another race that's coming up uh, in Alabama, a strong Republican state. And they selected... Uh, after a battle within the Republican Party, this ex-judge called Roy Moore. And there are allegations here uh, in the US that he may have been basically, uh, how, do, how do you put it, uh, with young girls that were not of legal age. Uh, and this is decades old, difficult to prove in a court of law. And the court of public opinion, of course, is very important. Um, let's, uh, let's go to Kevin first in New York. Uh, what, what, where are we with this? This is very strange and obviously uh, quite incredible, but the Republicans in Alabama seem to be sticking by their man and want him to run and take a seat in the U.S. Senate still. Well, I think this is a classic case of old America versus new America. New America is a reaction to Trumpism. Women of all backgrounds are terribly upset about what's been going on right from the time that he got exposed for the comment about grabbing them by their body part a year ago, but still got elected to office. We've seen since then the hashtag Me Too movement. We've seen the women's marches all around the country. We've seen this, there was this resistance to sexism, to patriarchy, to male-dominated leadership. And I think this Roy Moore uh, campaign in uh, Alabama wow. with the allegations is actually a reaction to that. But the, the tragedy to me is the fact that there's still hardcore voters are saying, we don't care what he did. They're bringing up stuff like, well, you know, look at Joseph and Mary. Mary was only 12 years old. I mean, manipulating, right. you know, biblical stories, you know, for, for political gain, which I think is insulting to the to, to women in this country, which is half of the, the population. And I also need to say something else that was raised earlier about Ronald Reagan. You know, I, many of us who are Democrats, myself included, never considered Ronald Reagan a strong Democrat back in the 1980s. He had a strong cabinet around him. He had a lot of problems as well. Let's not forget our Iran Contra okay, situation, okay. things like that. But the thing that we have to think about here is that just like in the 1980s, the Democrats are actually reacting to the Republicans. And while I applaud the victories of the Democrat in Virginia and some other places around the country, the issue for me, with, and I agree with one of the gentlemen who's speaking, I don't think this is going to affect uh, significantly Donald okay, well, Trump's Matt, opportunity Matt, to get reelected. Matt, I want to bring you in for the fast, uh, last word on Roy Moore. Um, is this where we've got in American politics, where it doesn't matter if someone has sexual allegations against them, as so long as you're in my party or you're corrupt or whatever in this party, it's become very tribal, or has this always been the case? Boy, the Roy Moore thing is a very unique circumstance politically. Um, and, and the reason for that now is that you, you can't remove him from the ballot. It's past the ballot deadline. Um, and so, look, I think the, the Republicans have really stepped away from him and divided from him. The RNC cut off fundraising today. That's the National Republican Party. The Republican Campaign Committee did that. Basically, every senator who endorsed him has unendorsed him. You've had the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell of Kentucky, and Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House now, calling him to get out okay. of the race. So we'll see where it goes in the next few days. But, uh, boy, this, this is a real mess. OK, I want to thank all our guests, Matt, in Texas. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, New York, Robert, in uh, Beijing, and of course, Simon Thank here you. in the studio. That's all we have for this edition of The Heat. That's all the time we have. I'm Nathan King, Washington, C. Thanks so much for being with us. See you soon.